Well, I guess I'm here. I'm standing between everyone and their first fenny, uh, which is the local alcoholic beverage, as I understand it. Not that I tasted it, I only smelt it. And uh, what you said, David, is exactly right. That was a segue into national reporting, which is the task that uh, Sandor and I agreed, uh, which is the heading here on this uh, slide. Identification of any issues arising from differences in national reporting standards to which the authority should respond. So we're now moving beyond what we talked about with commercial, uh, and frankly, I think the talks today have been excellent. You guys did a really good job of explaining the circumstance with the commercial. And even with the competent person thing, like, um, I I've done for 10 years or whatever, it's five years of mineral reporting, but my job doesn't require it, so I don't go out and seek to be the competent person. It's, it's, it's merely a mechanism to allow for the reporting in the mitigation of risk. And this Busang Rex example is it's like it's like the industry classic about risk. Now I'm from the government, so Geoscience Australia is a government organisation. I just got this slide here because we have a purpose built facility in Canberra, capital of Australia. And this um, this facility consists of offices and laboratories and core storage. So it's a dedicated geological resource for the nation of Australia. I've recently been appointed to the position of manager of offshore minerals, Geoscience Australia. Uh, the government wants to try and, or has expressed a desire to attempt to uh, have more industry engagement in offshore minerals in Australia. But at the same time, this uh, development came up with uh, the International Seabed Authority, so I've become involved in that as well. Okay, I'll, one, one thing I have got noted here that's relevant too, Geoscience Australia currently has about 600 employees. So it's a much smaller operation than the United States Geological Survey, but for a country the size of Australia, it's still a significant uh, organisation. I'll assume that works down. Okay, I'll just... Uh, a little bit of an outline of the presentation. We, we, every year, we do a national inventory of Australia's mineral resources. How do we get that? The government doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the people employed to go out and walk the ground and work things out. We use the information that comes through the Australian Stock Exchange, other forms of company reporting and in general it's material that is JORC certified for Australia because that's the Australian code. However, that has an absolute mapping capacity with Crisco and then at the same time the UNFC. Uh, in some ways the debate that we're having it's, it's, it's not that necessary because each of these things do translate to the other as long as you've got some way of interpreting between them and mapping, uh, you can use one to move your understanding into the other system. Okay, next slide. I'm going backwards. Okay. What's important here, and Neil attests to this, I'm sure, or Honorary Secretary General, it's much like a it's much like a national reporting situation with the ISA because it's a jurisdiction, it's, it's, it's not a commercial entity that's wanting to seek investor funds, it's a regulation authority that's mapping out areas, having interested commercial or potentially government entities come in to do mapping and hopefully get to the point that we get some sort of commercial activity. So the parallel that I'm drawing here, and I, I hope everyone appreciates that it's the same parallel, is that the ISA is much like a national, age, uh, a national authority. It's a jurisdiction. In Australia, we have we use the word jurisdiction for the states: New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania. So, if we're talking about jurisdictions in Australia, 
it's the same effect. Sure, it's a national body, it's Commonwealth, but there's also jurisdictions within that. Okay, and I guess the last paragraph there is just to say that this, this really is an ideal, if not critical time, with these uh, first contracts coming up in only 18 months' time or so, and in fact, you want to have the reporting in place before that, to really decide how we're going to go about having a national system for reporting or a jurisdictional system of reporting for the ISA. We've effectively already been through this slide um, and what I did just in the few minutes before this, I saw there are a whole lot of slides that I had. I've just saved you from a whole lot of death by PowerPoint, frankly, because I, I just deleted a whole lot, but I have kept a few that, that may well cross over with what's already been said. But my point here is, goes back to Caitlin, goes back to Matthew, this pre-feasibility assessment is the marker where you then move to possibly having some sort of more formal reserve established. And what I didn't say was you've got increased uncertainty going up this way, and then you've got increased and more certain data going across that way. So we're nowhere near down here. Nothing like it. What would you say, Matthew? Yeah, somewhere sort of up there somewhere? We've got, a long, we've got a long way to go to get to the point that we've got a resource that we can exploit, that we can actually mine. And there's a whole lot of factors, there's a whole lot of risks. And one of the risks that has come up again and again today is on the next slide. And I left that slide in on purpose because that how often do you have uh, this sort of area of human endeavour strike the front page of time? This, this was such a big deal at the time. And um, I went back to Google and double-checked. Yeah, the guy's name is Gutierrez. He fell from a helicopter 250 metres. They found the body months later. He'd basically been eaten by wild animals. And all, they identified him by a molar and a thumbprint. But um, the talk at the time, and I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but was that he basically felt guilty and it may well have been suicide. But that's the sort of... Um, the point of me saying that, that, that's the pressure that somebody who's going to be a competent person is under. They, they're really the point man or the point team if something should go wrong. And they, they want to, everything's on the line, their reputation, uh, they want to make sure that they get it as right as they possibly can. They might not work, they may well not have a good story to tell, but it's better to tell that story and be transparent and to have a negative situation like the Kirby Briefs. And I guess Briex did precipitate a whole lot of uh, ongoing activity that I was certainly aware of at the time in terms of improving the commercial reporting. But I'm not here to talk about commercial reporting. So what do countries report? And we're all aware that the USGS produces an annual statement Something comparable to what Australia does. Australia does something called economically demonstrated resources. So these are largely the four main categories in Crisco. But there are a couple of other um, sort of historical artefacts that sort of creep into those estimations. Uh, point here, and it's been raised by Dave and other people, you've got absolute granularity for the commercial reporting at the reserve stage, but as you stretch out to the longer term, that granularity sort of fades. So UNFC, as I see it, can act as a tool to try and incorporate some of that granularity. UNFC has the classes development pending and development on hold which could potentially provide a subdivision allowing uh, for better guidance for OSA. Okay. It's okay. I felt for Caitlin yesterday when that happened quite a few times. Uh, the light going out. Okay. So I already said about how the government's got strong parallels to ISA. And uh, the main point probably from this slide is that 
as I understand it, commercial entities are already using UNFC, but only for internal reporting. Uh, Dave's nodding, so I guess that's a correct understanding. Now I move on to the Australian experience. We don't need all the detail with this, but basically, um, it followed it followed on from the USA or the USGS McKelvey experience. We started to use a system similar to that back in 1970. It was 1975, yeah. Because at that time, the Australian government had a it's almost parallels with what's going on here. Uh, the Australian government had a very high uh, incentive to work out its mineral resource potential, and I. Looking back, mineral resources have become such an increasingly important part of the Australian economy, increasingly important part of our exports, that I, I can't help but wonder if some of this initiative and some of this work that was done in 1975 and subsequently has helped play out in terms of the understanding of Australia's mineral resources. It allowed Australia to have a better understanding of long-term potential resources that could then uh, for example, you, you need for infrastructure, you need for port facilities, you need for railways, whether or not decisions needed to be made by government to try and establish towns, etc. If you know you've got a resource there, the government's got more confidence in putting money into assisting industry in shared facilities. Now, GA resources are those that have got reasonable prospects for economic extraction the economic demonstrated resources. We publish this, and we still do it, we publish it annually uh, in a publication called Australia's Identified Mineral Resources. You can actually type into Google and you'll find that straight away. So uh, companies in Australia report publicly, basically using the Crisco, or that is in Australia the Jork standard. Oh, one thing, that I didn't uh, say was that GA resource, that economically demonstrated resource, it's meant to look out about 25 years. So it's the foreseeable future. So that's simply the, um, the McKelvey system and all that the economic demonstrated resources are produced on Australia and this piece here. So what we're talking about right now, what Matthew's been talking about with inferred would not fall into that category at this point in time. I think I just double clicked it. Okay, so the EDR, the economically demonstrated resources, are made up of three things. That is uh, JORP, proven and probable, which equals UNFC commercial projects, which is 111, 112. Potential medium term economic resources, EDR2, which is dual measured and indicated mineral resources, which is basically UNFC22, and I'll put X there because it's, you've got three there on the third criteria. And then potential long term economic resources. Now, it's, uh, we bring those in but we take a lot of care with how much of that uh, is actually assessed. Okay, next one. What we're talking about here, though, is the correlation of that system with the UNFC. I pretty well already explained that. Uh, 112, 111, 112, and 221, 222. And then inferred resources, which are catered for in UNFC, but not in Crisco in the same way, uh, identified by 223, giving you the granularity in UNFC that you don't necessarily get with Crisco because there's more categories that exist. I'll try to explain that a bit further. I think we've already seen this picture in a way, uh, but basically, David said it, moving up through the categories is you've got a better fix on the resource. So, move up here to shorter and shorter time frames. So down here it's something like 25 years. Here in the case of uh, seabed nodules it's going to be even more, maybe 50 years. You're out seeking extra information 
to push it up through the categories. But what, what's critical with the Geoscience Australia information is that it's based, first and foremost, upon the information produced by people like Matthew. It's based on the company reports drawing together to make that national inventory. Okay, and one other aspect that goes right back to 1935 is we use a number of historic reports to, uh, to bolster or to provide us with more information where possible. But we have exactly the same issue regarding, say, uh, quarantining for environmental purposes or other infrastructure purposes uh, or other infrastructure difficulties. Uh, right at the moment, we're doing a project at GSI Australia called Economic Fairways, where we're trying to uh, produce a graphical image of parts of Australia uh, using depth to cover, cover uh, existing infrastructure to try and produce a heat map, if you like, of those areas that will be more appropriate for resource development. Okay. So you've got inferred here, which is all we're talking about now at this stage. So we're at a very early stage. Just like Australia's economically demonstrated resources are actually these ones here. So we've got a little bit to go before we move down into this box. anticipates the movement of resources to reserves. You're always uh, wanting to take criteria that you can to move to the next category. Okay. Okay, I've pretty well already said that. Basically, um, the International Seabird Authority requirements reflect national reporting. It's just reinforcing again. You've got several jaw categories are aggregated to get your economic demonstrated resource. box here. We have inferred resources that sit out on the edge and then these other categories that we hold here at GSON Australia. Now, when you're dealing with a national resource, it's impossible to talk about the grade uh, of that resource at the same time as you're bulking together all these individual deposits. You've got a whole lot of individual deposits that have got a lot of inherent characteristics and you need to somehow amalgamate them. You cannot do that if you incorporate the grade as well. So what you need to do is just take the, uh, the absolute amount and amalgamate that. But the way that you're protected in doing that is because you've already made the assessment of what is an economically demonstrated resource. So you've already taken the information and proven that you've got something that is worth considering economically before you then move to having a number that you report nationally. So here's an example. You've got three different copper deposits. 
And I can read it out, but uh, basically the, the first one's got 355 million tonnes, 1.2%. Next one, 0.9% in reserves, 0.8% in resources. Next one, 2.3% in reserves, 2% in resources. All of those are very different numbers. Uh, you cannot amalgamate those simply. So what we do is we just take the bulk amount. We know that it's met the criteria to be an economically demonstrated resource, and we just bulk it together to make the national resource. So then what do we report? We just report the one hard number. Economically demonstrated resource, uh, maybe the case of Bulk site. There's uh, 6464, and that's million tonnes. So it's just the simple one number. And then we've got the Jork reserves that are substantially, as in the case of Bauxite, it's 33%, substantially smaller component than that economically demonstrated resource. Uh, that's another good one. Maybe cobalt, because we're talking about cobalt. We know we've got an economically demonstrated resource, something that will be uh, developable with within about the next 25 years, only 36% of that meets your criteria. Okay. So the whole issue that we've been talking about the last couple of days is this mapping to a universal template. Have How do we have a harmony between the various systems that we've got and how do we uh, use that to compare world infantries, or in this case, ISA infantries? Uh, I came into this thinking that the best way was to go with the UNFC. It has the granularity, but the issue uh, that we seem to have, or an issue that we, we have, is that we've got people that have now got familiarity with using the Crisco, and my understanding was that they're not really in competition, but on the other hand, there's a decision point here about what gets used. And we're, we're, we seem to be embarking upon Crisco in terms of the discussion as we're proceeding today. Crisco will work, it'll, it'll do us a job, and in fact it might well be a relatively uh, simple solution. Maybe the downside might be that it's not quite as elegant because you haven't got as much granularity as you do with the UNFC. Having said that, the two are interchangeable, so you can map from one to the other in any case. Okay. So I have to say, I prepared these before the conversation occurred yesterday and today, obviously, and at that time I was thinking the UNFC was the primary way to go. Uh, basically, for this slide, key points are that um, many jurisdictions have already mandated commercial reporting systems, as we've heard about. So they don't necessarily need to adopt the UNFC, and others may choose to use the UNFC. So basically, it's, it's something that can be used. It's a tool that's there. but question is if you've already got uh, some form of system that's working, or almost working, if we do a few modifications as we've talked about today, it may well be that that'll uh, get us over the line for what's necessary in the next 18 months. Okay, next slide's just a picture. So, go back again to that economically demonstrated resource. Got current dual reserves, proven impossible. 111, 112, using the EFG system. Without going into each of them, this is the one that stands out to me as um, where UNFC offers a benefit, if you like. We've got 223 here, where it's a dual inferred resource. That's not to say that it's not going to get reported through Crisco. Crisco doesn't carry as many categories. 
So the advantage with UNFC is that you're going to be able to have a finer resolution of those boundaries, of those categories. I think we've already seen that two-dimensional diagram. It's basically doing the same thing. It's representing the mapping of the two systems. And similar effect there, just sort of almost going over what we did already. You've got a decreasing degree of uh, information as you go, or production likelihood as you go down. Okay. Have I gone backwards? No, this is the one slide that I did want to bring up. Same effect uh, as, remember the earlier slide? It's just another way of looking at the same thing. You've got EDR, which is just on Australia's national inventory. It uses proved, probable, measured, indicated, does not incorporate inferred. Okay. So, what we're looking for here is a framework for all the contractors. We want to have a decision taken to ensure that contractors know what the rules are and know exactly where to go forward. I think we can do that through the next couple of days or alternatively we set up a further working group to resolve any outstanding issues if we don't, um, if we can't get it through in the next couple of days. How would that work? Would it be a Crisco UNFC expert working group? Uh, sort of under the auspices of the ISA, because that's the, the need, it's specifically for ISA needs. We talked at length about competent persons, um, that's clearly an issue, uh, but once again, I think we can get around it. Uh, process is required to incorporate definitions and other anomalous requirements into UNFC 2009 to cover the international reporting. I don't think risk and uncertainty here have the same uh, impact that they do in a commercial situation. This is simply for the national or jurisdictional authority. And one thing that concerns, or has concerned me, which, since I very first started thinking about this, is until we actually have mining, until we've really pragmatically got something happening, we don't, in the UNFC case, we can't move to uh, level one, for example. You, you're always going to be uncertain about whether it's going to work. But life's like that. Okay. The key point here is just the reinforcement that the national inventory or the jurisdictional inventory is about aggregating the resources of individual deposits and that's exactly the mechanism that we're seeking through this. What will you get by having a national inventory? You'll have a regular evaluation of what resources look like they're available in the foreseeable future for mineral development. That will then play into policies and how that information, that information will then get used to debate what issues uh, come up as deep sea mining proceeds. I mean, one issue that comes to my mind is, frankly, the United States hasn't signed. It's, if there's a better uh, assessment of what might be available and some sort of encouragement to have the United States involved again, Perhaps that would be a good thing. And you, you'll do that through information by measurement. Okay, summary of issues identified. I think Australia's terrestrial experience does help in terms, or it, it provides background in terms of how these JORC, Crisco, UNFC systems can be incorporated to make a national or jurisdictional, a jurisdictional. Uh, inventory. You only get individual deposit data through the commercial reporting and somehow you've got to amalgamate that. Uh, 
there might be a concern with commercial entities if there's any form of duplication of reporting required. So I, I think what we're going to need to have is a system whereby the commercial entities, or in some cases it's government entities, are able to use the information that comes from the Crisco or Jork reporting or uh, the Canadian reporting and just use that immediately. They don't want to be in a situation where they have to go and recalculate or do things in a secondary way. So then the bottom line, and this, this even came up, like I, I made this slide a few weeks ago, um, do we convene an expert ISA, Crisco, UNECE working committee to ensure that the reporting of C4 mineral resources satisfies requirements of commercial reporting? At this stage, most of we inferred resources, or well, that's all they'll be. But we would add granularity to describe the status of potential projects. And that's, that's probably the benefit that you're going to get if we do move to a UNFC type system. Okay, so then conclusions. Uh, jurisdictional mineral resource classification systems can be correlated on a broad basis with UNFC 2009 or with Crisco. Uh, with Crisco you're going to be ending up lumping together some of the UNFC classifications because there is more granularity. Uh, if you've got to take advantage of the UNFC granularity, you've got to use the, the original resource data, but that's exactly what we want to do. Why would you not go and use the original data? You would need to use the Crisco bridging document. And as I said earlier, there's, there's going to be issues that remain with the competent person question, the QA to QC. Uh, yeah, the international assessment reporting of C4 mineral resources. Um, you're going to have major financial implications if we don't get this right. We want to have it. Uh, as best a system as we can, and I've heard it said a few times today, you try and get it right the first time rather than going back and reinventing it. And that was pretty well I had to say. Hopefully I've made that, it's been a bit awkward in a sense, I've made it a lot shorter than what I originally was going to say. Um, I took out a whole lot of slides that I think weren't relevant, but I uh, hope that helps. So, over to David. Thank you very much, much Paul. Confused everyone. You discussed <laughs> the, the primary benefit of a focus on the UNFC is the increased granularity. So now that that does uh, bring with it an increased level of effort to fulfill that that granularity. I'm not sure the benefit of that in the short term. In any case, the uh, Crisco system brings with it a set of rules that determine, that help bring uniformity to the classification that's of immediate interest. And it needs to be done no matter which framework. So that, that seems like a given that something like the Crisco system expanded as necessary to meet uh, whatever other, other systems or uh, other interests we have um, is, is a core. In the long term, I see the benefit of the increased granularity, but I could only come up with one or two uh, things to put into that increased uh, granularity yeah. right now. And that would take a tremendous amount of research to even document those. That's it. So I, I see that. I, I see you looking farther in the future. You, you've made a perfect assessment. When I was putting these slides together, I saw the UNSC as the way to go. I really did. But as I've sat here, over, well, it's only been two days, I've heard these guys are doing the work using Crisco, it's, uh, the information's already there, and they've made the assessment that they think that, um, I don't know if over a couple of years it'll really work, but you know, it might not take that much effort to just take the Crisco and we'll have something that we can use. And, and, and then why not evolve into UNFC over time? It's not, it's not to say there's anything wrong with UNFC necessarily, but if you've got something that you can readily uh, take now, use, solve the problem that we've got that's coming up in only 18 months' time, 
it seems logical. I just want to make sure that you're one area where I think there is something that the NFC adds value to now is that unfortunately you're going to be truncating a lot of the value of your deposits if you only use the Crisco system because it only has a uh, place to put volumes that have reached a certain level of maturity. There's a greater volume associated with these deposits that are not associated with projects that we can identify today that won't be captured if you only use a Crisco system. It was the appropriate thing to do in the case that we, we discussed earlier um, uh, in, in doing an actual disclosure for market purposes. That is exactly what you should do. You should immediately use the Crisco template for that. But if you're really trying to look at total value of these deposits, I, I'm I'm concerned that you might be underestimating those and, and missing some value. But we would be, we just wouldn't be evaluating it yet. We wouldn't be ignoring it. that would come into it and have a uh, later on. Um, well, we should go back to the previous slide. That last paragraph. It seems to remain because mining yet is yet to proceed, so questions of QA and TC and the definition of a cooperative person approves this is required to a The only, I've heard one objection by a contractor. I haven't heard any comments from the other contractors. I'm trying to solve a problem for the next <coughs> day. That contractor appeared to have a problem with the term competent person. You made a comment. You said we could get around that. How do we get around Yeah, as I understand it, the UNFC's got around that competent person, person question. And I'll refer to David for the expertise, if you like, on that. Well, the, the UNFC is still based on Crisco, so for the report, for the estimation of, of, volume, of, of volumes under the Crisco template, Still, you still have to use a, a competent, competent person. person. You, you need a point person. There, right. However, to fill in the other quantities, you would yeah. really need to have a competent he, person. There, there's your answer then, I think. You, 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 you need to have a point person that's going to take, <coughs> that's going to bear the weight. So you're going to need to go with Crisco. Okay, so this, this, we're getting around that. In other words, I read this. No, we still don't have to have a public person. Right, or a public mean, person, whatever you want. Yeah, that doesn't mean going with Crisco, because you, right. you, you need a competent person with Crisco, and you need a competent person if you're going to use a UNFC for, for these sorts yeah. of things. It's, it is the same same thing. OK, that, that was my concern. I mean, it's not, we haven't heard from any of the other contractors in relation to the public person. I, I hear one objection. Yep. I'm still trying to solve my problem. So I'm trying to figure out how I move forward to get a system, yeah? Uh, depending on what my other colleagues said. There was also a question raised earlier about taking the template and making adjustments for polymetallic nodules to that template. Um, Trying to figure out whether we just we also go ahead with that and return to this discussion after the uh, after the contract is yeah because yeah I'm wondering if it's yeah because it is, as I sit right now it's like we are half stuck somewhere based on an objection by one contractor <coughs> so far that same contractor made a comment that um, his colleagues the other contractors had not commented he felt he was representing them from his comment. So I'd like to make a suggestion. It's getting to five o'clock. I'd like to suggest we, suggest that we go forward uh, this evening, if we might, and um, do the adjustment to the template. If tomorrow mm. that template could be circulated to all of the contractors, we go through the contractor uh, presentation and come back and get comments to that uh, reword template. 
and see how we proceed after that. Yeah. Um, yep. And I'd also like to add, these are the global commons. They don't belong to any state. I do, no. I, I do hear comments which sound like, uh, this is my resource. I don't quite understand what it means in that context of the global commons. Um, people acquire rights to these resources. However, it's not theirs. They acquire rights, they are rules, regulations, and procedures that they follow in relation to those resources. There are also, for example, exploration contracts. Those are the contracts that we have currently in place. Our regulations ask for certain information and data from these contractors, in particular as they relate to the resources. We need something that enables us as the authority to administer these resources. It doesn't help if there's no commonality in the re reporting standards, nor in what we are reporting. It just creates, I mean, yep. we, have, we have nothing. Yep, these leases or these contracts are a bundle of rights and obligations. They are a bundle of rights and obligations, and that's all they are. The obligations are to do the reporting that's required, and the right, hopefully in the future, is to exploit the resource and make a commercial benefit from it, which benefits everybody. in the context of the Frisco reporting template. Now, if I heard Pat and, and Matthew clearly, the purpose of the competent person in the context of uh, the Frisco document is to is in the context of the public reporting where companies are primarily going to the stock exchange to raise funds to carry out their work. Now, in the case of the CBED authority, Yes, we do now have companies that have exploration licenses, but predominantly the current licenses are held by states or state entities who presumably do not uh, have to worry about this issue of competent persons because they and they alone are the judge of whether to put money into doing uh, further work. So if, 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 if I'm understanding that correctly, then it does seem to me that in looking at this reporting template, we could leave aside the issue of the competent persons for the purposes of its role as a supporting document to help the reporting on resources uh, with, the, uh, with the work of the authority at this point in time. Um, I'm not so sure that that's correct, but I certainly agree with the SG uh, that uh, this evening, uh, Pat and uh, Matthew, I'm pleased that you taken up the uh, challenge of bringing together a small group. I understand it's open-ended so that anyone can, uh, can join. I think Sandor has some detailed arrangements as to where and what time we'll meet. But I, I just would like some clarification as to the extent to which the issue of competent persons as captured in this document at the moment does apply to those exploration contracts that with the authority that are held by states or states. Sure. Um, just may I ask, may, may I go one step further before you do answer that? Um, the seabed authority is to administer these resources. An exploration contract is given out for 15 years. <laughs> it, at the end of 15 years, as the seabed authority, we need to know something about the resources that have been identified there and their category. It's not obvious to me that because it's a state entity, that information is not required. I, I have a difficulty with that. I go back, it's not within any national jurisdiction. It's the global commons. The rules are very clear. We're all 
supposed to work by these rules, regulations, and procedures. Certain information are asked of contractors, no matter their category, whether we describe them as state entities, commercial bodies, etc., etc. Um, I don't. I would like to figure out a way of getting around a competent person, but if the systems available require such individual, and these are the international standards, yeah. I can't justify giving land to somebody for 15 years, at the end of which I say, I have no information on the resource because it was a state or a state entity. These are the global commons. It's not in anybody's jurisdiction. It's in all our jurisdiction. Yeah? So for 15 years, I give away an area that is resource rich. Because it's a state entity or a state, I don't get any information about the resources according to whatever international standards have been developed for terrestrial resources. I mean, there's something there that confuses me to no end. I'm sorry. Okay, but it's covering quite a, a large area. and. Uh, uh, I, I can certainly confirm that the intent of the competent person and the qualified person system is to, uh, to provide that level of protection for the investing public. It's to do with reporting to the public where uh, shareholder funds are raised and, uh, and it's to conform with the uh, share market, the stock market's uh, own rules about protecting the investing public and informing the investing public. Um, I think it's, it's a, a good point, and I think it, it's a genuine point of discussion, uh, the degree to which the like, competent person system is required going back down the chain, if you like into a time period before it's applicable, before the reporting is applicable at the Crisco stage. Um, I mean, the key thing, how, whatever sort of estimate you're making of quantity and quality, is that it's done by a competent, I won't use the word competent in this, it's done by experienced uh, people who uh, have sufficient knowledge and understanding to, to make these estimates and uh, for people who then use the estimates to have confidence in them. Um, that doesn't require the competent person system which, which has the added requirements related to public reporting. Um, I think the principles still apply, that you do, do need people who know what they're doing in this situation, who have experience in, in the activity they're undertaking. So I think many of the, um, the aspects of the competent person apply whatever you're, however you're reporting into the UNFC boxes where these are uh, not yet ready to go into inferred resource or beyond, um, but certainly the requirements uh, to belong to a national organization that can discipline you wouldn't be one that would be required at that, that earlier stage, uh, and probably one or two other aspects as well. So, you know, I, I think again, it's, it's thinking um, in a common sense way how we can apply what the intent behind that is without that additional regulatory intent. Can I just um, make a comment there to that? Uh, I, I think that makes eminent sense that we, if you like, dodge the issue for the moment because until until you've got uh, mining proceeding under the hard terms of what you, the understanding is of a competent person, you just can't have it. So do we have a sort of a moratorium for a few years on that requirement as it stands now, sort of do a guideline now that says a person that's got some understanding, scientific understanding, whatever, and doesn't meet the OZ IMM or uh, you know whatever else requirements, AIG requirements. Um, the, you, as an independent authority, can 
choose to do whatever you want to on your own resource assessment. You can choose to adopt the principles of Crisco. I think you would not be able to say the estimates are based on the Crisco template if you didn't require a competent person. This is my understanding. You would not be able to say, here's a Crisco estimate. But you could say, this is an estimate that meets the ISA standards for reserves and resource assessment which is loosely based on the Crisco template with some modifications to meet the specific needs that, that you need. So effectively, you're, you're creating your own standard that is strongly coupled to an existing standard. And that, that's really, nobody can complain about that. I think the, the postponement of this is actually a good idea, in particular because the Crisco is in consultation with India, China, and a few other countries that are, are uh, contractors, that, that are sponsoring states, and see how that goes. I mean, I understand that there has been progress in that, which would make it even uh, more widely applicable. But right now, simply getting according to the current national authorities, whatever they are, a response to the requirement at the end of the 15-year period to submit what would actually be their best effort to comply with their own national definitions of those. And it, as we get more involvement, or more, if, if Crisco widens its membership, so much the better. And it still remains consistent with UNFC. So I think the, the Secretary General's uh, suggestion uh, is completely workable with all our interests. And we'll just make the best of it. I'd say one more thing on this is if you, if you do choose, in line with the field, say, if you do choose to come up with your own a system with you know based on Crisco with some modifications, you could also look to add some of the specific categories within the UNSC that you would want to capture. I mean, I, I think you'd want to know what the, the total total volume in place in the deposits is. You wouldn't know that if you just had Crisco reporting. There, there are a few other things like that that I think would be very valuable to have, and that would certainly ease the transition to a full UNSC adoption at a later date. During that time, perhaps Matthew could work with Tonga on your results to actually uh, map across to the UNRC to see actually that maybe some of them, I don't know, the difficulties that you think you might face are actually not there. Just a, a thought. Thanks. say that we complete the immediate task before taking on new ones. The task is to get the re reporting requirements that we want for the end of the current contracts. I just have a, I just have an open question. Are we now different, differentiating between uh, types of contractors? first task is to figure out we're getting we're supposed to get some reports that come to us. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to receive some reports from contractors uh, if there's no extension really very soon. If there's an extension I presume that we can get these reports also. Um, I want to get there. I've heard an objection. I've suggested that we should go ahead with the contractor uh, presentations and at the same time make the adjustments we need to the template, the crystal template, and then come back to that after the contractor presentation <coughs> and pick up this conversation because the objection was to the term competent person. Let's take up that conversation with the modified template of Crystal immediately following the uh, contractor presentations and go around the room with all the contractors and see exactly how we proceed. I've only heard one objection to the competent person. Thank you. The reason why I'm asking the question 
Mr. Secretary General, is because what I heard earlier on, um, and I don't recall who it was, I think uh, it was you, man. Um, there was a solution found in the case of, uh, of Tonga. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they found a solution to the question of the, uh, of the uh, competent person. So I'm, one, I'm, just one, I'm just wondering if, if the possibility exists there, why doesn't the same possibility exist uh, for the organization, for the authority? Okay. Um, Tonga went completely ahead and utilized the standards that existed. There was, there was no objection from Tonga to that. I heard another contractor whose comment was that a competent person, they wouldn't accept it. Isn't that what you said? That's correct. I, I said as a DC member, I don't represent the contract. I am, I'm the person in you, let's see. <laughs> then you are totally correct. Yeah, it's fine. I think it's an individual opinion, that's all. I don't represent it. No, I'm only representing ISA. <laughs> <laughs> you gave us a lecture on other contractors not saying anything, and you were saying it. Maybe whatever reason I heard all that. So who are you talking? Uh, no, I stand much? by it. I stand by it. Maybe other contractors are not expressing, but as an LTC member, I express. Can I, can I make a point, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that um, perhaps we should look, we should distinguish between uh, uh, two things uh, here because I see uh, that uh, the objectives of that uh, workshop uh, was that that we um, uh, we we trying to support uh, the LTC with a tool which allow them to to, to uh, justify the applications of contractors for extending of their contracts. And I think that this is a priority here. And this is one thing. And the second thing, I, I've got a feeling that, that we are now uh, during the discussions, is the kind of um, adoption by the ISA, some kind of regulations as a general. And uh, I must say that, that uh, I fully support the, the first uh, uh, element here, but I am not ready to discuss uh, the latter because I think this is too serious thing and we will not have the time here to, to, to discuss, uh, to, to adopt some kind of a guidelines of uh, regulations for all purposes which may appear in the future. I think that this is important, but I think that we cannot solve, self, uh, solve uh, this issue here. Thank you. I think we recognize the, the objective raised by the Secretary General, yeah. but I think we talk in terms of principles. The whatever system we adopt, the requirement of a competent person is mandatory for public reporting. Now we need to define our objective. Is a contractor or the authority is going to make public reporting? In my opinion, no, except those who are mandated. In my view, the objective is internal reporting between the contractor and the authority so that authority has a sort of uniform basis of understanding what work has been done by which contractor. Period. I, I don't think there is any other objective in this case, and therefore it helps to define whether you follow one model or the other, except that we can find a solution where we do not need a competent person, but we, we replace it by a similar requirement so that we can say it is consistent with the with the general requirements of the, of the system, but not necessarily mandated by the CP's signature. That is all I'm saying. So I, re, I will re-emphasize that the mandatory requirement of a CP is only for public reporting, and public reporting 
to my understanding, is not mandatory either for the contractor or for the uh, uh, authority. Thank you. In fact, I'd say the, the ISA can't actually mandate to the individual companies how they do their estimates for uh, public reporting. That's going to be determined by whatever entity they're reporting to. Every, every entity that's collecting information can choose to make their own rules. You need to make your you need to make a decision on what you want to have captured. It could be a blend of multiple systems. It's the ASC that gives out the contract. So to whom are the contracts? Well, to, to, the to, the to the authority. To the authority. They be reporting to the ISA. So the ISA needs to choose what information you want to gather and what governance structure you want to have that's backing up that report. You can choose to set that governance structure however you want to. But I'll tell you, the petroleum industry, we don't have a requirement for a competent person. We do say, however, that you need to have a clear description of what your governance is behind that estimate. And every company, actually, that reports to the US SEC, for example, has a slightly different governance structure, and they just defend that, and uh, the SEC chooses to accept it or not. No, so let's go ahead with my recommendation. Let's have a meeting this evening. It's 7.30 of where? 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.30. 7.
Submitted their presentation and I will present it. And that's the uh, Russia, you know. So it's only one missing. And, and, and I think uh, after the presentation of the constructor, many, many of these issues here will be way, way more clear. So I'll see you tomorrow at 9.